Revelation 14. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in, the in their mouth was found no guile. And they are without fault before the throne of God. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to Him. For the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven, and earth, and the sea, and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever. And they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, and they may, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap. For the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the altar which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry unto him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse bridle, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Uh, dear Lord, I pray God you'd be with this service today, Lord. Come meet with us. Help us to hear from your word, Lord. Help us to be safe today. And help us to just experience the, the joy that comes from knowing we are saved. And we're here on a Sunday trying to hear your word and hear and feel your love that you have for us. God bless us. Bless those that are meeting today in the same capacity. We pray though for those, Lord, even now that are traveling. Lord, bless this service and this preaching. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Revelation chapter 14. Now, if we were to... Quickly turn, keep your page in Revelation 14, to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. Now, as we know, uh, based on our study from last week, Revelation 14 comes on the heels of what's known as the mark of the beast. Now, I explained, and what I believe is the case, is that in Revelation 13, you're finding a transition that goes from basically the beginning of sorrows 
into um, the abomination of desolation placed in the holy place where the worship of the beast and the image is instituted, followed by a great tribulation which no doubt would ensue following such a, 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 a charge being placed before men where basically you worship or you die. You, you must worship otherwise you die. You must receive this mark otherwise you have no part in the time which is to come. Now Luke chapter 21 gives us a little bit of a glimpse into this as well. Luke chapter 21, beginning in verse 29, the Bible reads, And he spake to them a parable, Behold the fig tree and all trees. When they now shoot forth, you see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And take heed to yourself, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on the, all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth, Watch ye therefore, and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things which shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. The Son of Man. And as we enter into that time period, which maybe we're here, maybe we're not, known as the beginning of sorrows, and as we start to see the, 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 the timing set up to where the abomination could be set up, we need to keep this text in mind and realize that this is something that we ought to be taking heed to, as far as the Word of God is concerned. We ought to be watching ourselves, making sure we're not getting involved in drunkenness and surf fighting and the cares of this world overtaking us. We need to be watching these events as they transpire and praying always, not just now, but even so much the more when this comes to pass, that you'd be accounted worthy to escape the things that are coming upon this earth. Now, in Revelation 13, and you can go back to chapter 14, you find that the mark of the beast is instituted. And at such a time, then you would no doubt have people clamoring, people confused, people scared and worried and concerned, and all of these cares of this life coming upon them for just the regular everyday things like providing food for yourself, providing shelter, how am I going to make it through? You even lost people saying, I don't really necessarily want to take this mark. I don't understand what it all means. And so great fear would fall over everybody, and so watchfulness from the Christians is, is, is paramount. It's so important. We need to be watching and hoping for Christ to return at that moment so that we can be in his presence escaping these things that are coming upon the face of the earth. Now, if you look in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 1, it says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion. Okay, so Mount Zion is what's being referred to here. Now, you could go and you could go to Matthew chapter 21 and verse 5. Matthew chapter 1, 20 and verse 5. And you could see what's being referred to here. Matthew chapter 21 and verse 5. Zion. What is this place? Zion. It says there in Matthew 21 verse 5, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh to thee meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. Now, you could take that reference of Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9 and capture what it's talking about there, and you'll find in that context, you can go there yourself, but when he says, tell you the daughters of Zion, it's reiterated as with a Z. So Zion is technically and usually the New Testament translation of Zion with a Z. Now, it says in that same statement of Zechariah 9, verse 9, it says, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, tell ye the daughter of Jerusalem, likening these to one in the same place. Uh, Romans chapter 11 and verse 16 calls out Isaiah 59 and verse 20 and does the same thing. It is Zion with an S and then Zion with a Z, with the same quotation in place. Now go to Hebrews chapter 22, and that doesn't exist. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 22 Hebrews 12 and verse 22, and it says, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. Now, 
This is the Mount Zion that's being called down. That's exactly what you see in Revelation chapter 14. He says, Lo, he saw a lamb which stood on the Mount Zion. So this isn't referring to, I believe, a group of mountains in the northern part of, of, uh, of Palestine there. But rather, it's focusing in on the heavenly Jerusalem. The, the, uh, the city of the living God, as was referred to in Hebrews chapter 12. That area, that space where there is an innumerable company of angels, that mountain, the heavenly Jerusalem, I believe is what he is seeing in Revelation chapter 14. And you can go back there. In Revelation chapter 14, he looked and he sees a lamb. Now we know this to be the lamb of God. And that carries out, this is I believe the 13th reference of the lamb in the book of Revelation. And the first one indicates very clearly with context all around it that it is the Lord Jesus Christ. Here he stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred and forty and four thousand, having their father's name written in their forehead. And we've heard of these before, haven't we? One hundred and forty-four thousand. Now, if you could, you can go back to Revelation chapter seven. Revelation chapter seven. When you first hear of these in verse two, it says, "And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt." the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And it goes on to say that there is an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel, Judah, Reuben, Gad, Aser, Nephtalim, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin, each had twelve thousand represented in this great multitude, 144,000 the total, of the tribes of the children of Israel. Okay, so it gives us that statement about them. They're being sealed in their foreheads, and they are what, essentially the sealing of them is what is holding off the judgment here of the earth and of the sea. Back in Revelation 14, this group is mentioned, and it's right after a sealing taken, is taking place in Revelation 7, but in 14, it's right after a sealing of another type is taking place. By the time you get to Revelation 14, we find them already sealed. They have the Father's name written in their foreheads. That doesn't mean that these events aren't synonymous. It just means that we're now a little bit behind where we were in the first place. And Revelation 13, just previous, there was a sealing in the forehead, but it wasn't of God. It wasn't of the mark of God. It was the mark of de the devil. It was the mark of the Antichrist, the mark of the beast placed upon their foreheads. And here we find now, I believe, in heaven, the mention of those 140,000 that are sealed in their foreheads, ready to perform what their deal is and what their job is. We saw the seals were open in Revelation chapter 6, right before this event. We find a sealing of men to basically their final destiny is being under the judgment of God because they've taken the mark of the beast. Now we get into 14, and what we find? We find these 144,000 that are about to perform what their duty is as far as being sealed and of God. So... You find, and I heard a voice from heaven, verse 2, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts, and the elders. And no man can learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits of God, and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, and they are without fault before the throne of God. And that statement there basically wipes out what the Jehovah's Witnesses teach about these. This is a very clear indication that we found in previous reference in verse or chapter 7 that they are of the tribes of the children of Israel, clearly marked as such. Not only that, it says they're not defiled with virgin. Not only that, it says they follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. And we know that post-resurrection he found himself up there in the right hand of God. Now we find that they are singing a song that no man can learn. And I believe essentially that is the final job before. For these is that they would sing and they would praise and they would rejoice in the God of heaven. Now, 
In transitioning, like I said in Revelation 13, from the beginning of Soros to the abomination to the worship of the beast and the image, you can find a similar series of events happening in Revelation chapter 6. And this is why I think these two uh, chapters, 7 and 14, and then 6 and 13, are kind of going together. You find in chapter 6, the Lamb opened one of the seals, and, and then after that he says, come and see. In other words, that you were someplace, John was, and he had to come and see what transpired after the seal was opened. How I picture this happening is essentially up in heaven, he has this great image of the throne of God, he sees this, he has a vision, he's in heaven, and then every time the lamb there in heaven, next to, in the New Jerusalem, opens a seal, the angel says to him, come and see. It's almost like he had to go from where he was to look down and behold. I think he's witnessing events that are transpiring upon earth. And when he looks, he finds first that um, white horse who was given a bow and crown goes forth to conquer. The next seal opens. We find the red horse. Power was given to take peace from the earth. The third seal opens. He hears the beast say, come and see. And then there's the black horse with a pair of balances. Suddenly a measure of wheat costs a whole day's labor. The fourth seal, come and see. Death and hell falls with him. And there's this great death by the sword and by hunger and by the beast of the earth that comes upon this earth. And then by the time you get to the fifth seal, you find those that are slain for the word of God, for the testimony which they held. And that's where I believe the, the mark of the beast starts to be implemented. Where you find this onslaught of believers that are slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they have. Finding themselves in heaven crying out, how long Lord, faithful and tutors, that not judge and avenge our blood and them that dwell on the earth. And he says, yet for a little season. So there's a little space given after that. Finally, you get to that sixth seal being opened. And then those famous sayings, the sun and moon become black as sackcloth. The moon shall become as blood. And then we find the stars falling from heaven. And if you watch those events, you find that that's leading up and preceding the coming of our Lord and, by our, and our gathering together unto him. So, the cry is made in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 17, the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Followed by chapter 7, and we find that famous um, phrase that we all look to as a sign of the gathering of his elect. In verse 9, where he says, A great multitude which no man can number of all nations, kindreds, and peoples, and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hand, and they cry out salvation unto our God and to his Lamb. And so we look at that as the coming of our Lord at the onslaught of his wrath being poured upon the face of the earth. So back in Revelation chapter 14, we find, again, the purpose of the 144,000. And I believe that is praise and worship and following the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. And it's been taught, and I've heard that these are all Jewish evangelists that are going to and fro and here and there in the earth preaching the gospel. But I, I, I don't find that, especially in the context that we're dealing with. What I do find is a group that is sealed, that has harps, sings a song that no man has learned, except them, and they are virgins, and they were redeemed from among men, first fruits of the Lamb, following him whithersoever he goeth, and in their mouth was, for, was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And I think where that idea comes from, them being evangelists, is that in verse 6 in Revelation 14, you find immediately mentioned in that context, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. So maybe I'm missing something, but it seems that it's the other angel that has the gospel to preach unto all the earth and not these 144,000 of all the tribes of Israel specifically. So this angel comes, he brings the everlasting gospel. Now regarding this gospel, is this the gospel that we're used to? Is, or is it a different gospel? Is, is there, is, do they break up into the everlasting gospel and the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of this and the gospel of that and all these different dispensations with their different ones preaching? No, I believe what we're witnessing is actually just another side of the same gospel. The same gospel coin that has two sides. And what are those two sides? Redemption or judgment? 
redemption or recompense, right? The gospel comes to somebody in truth, and it can either save them or it can destroy them based on their decision with what they do with it. And that's what happens when this everlasting gospel comes via the other angel flying in the midst of heaven, taking it to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. He says this in verse 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. Worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. Specifically, this is the gospel of redemption. Yes, fear God. Believe on Him. Trust Him. Give Him the, the, the perfect position in your life where you fear nothing but Him. And ask Him for redemption. But at this point... Following the mark of the beast, the gospel is going forth more from the standpoint of recompense and judgment than it is redemption. There might be a select few out there that hear the gospel and get saved. It's very minimal at this point. Most of the Christians are being slayed for the word of the God and for the testimony which they had. They're in a mode of scattering at this point, just fleeing many of them, where, you know, and not even going back to take anything out of their house. Here the gospel goes forth, and it's one of recompense to these people. Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. And if you remember back in Revelation chapter 6, that same phrase is made. It says, the great day of His wrath is come. Is come. And there, you can link those two phrases together. His wrath is come, and here in Revelation 14, the day of His judgment is presently come. Now what happens following this? The angel comes and he, he shouts out that you ought to give glory to God. His judgment is come, whether you like it or not. Fear him above all things, whether you like it or not. This is the position that the whole world is falling under. And the announcement comes next. There followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, verse 8, is fallen. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she made all nations to drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And this is actually the first mention in the book of Revelation of Babylon. Now we know she's going to play a great role in the chapters to come, if you've read ahead as I have. But this here is our first mention. And she's not destroyed here, but she is certainly defeated. She's fallen, that great city is fallen that great city is fallen look in revelation chapter 6 and you'll find out what we mean by that revelation 6 and verse 12 it says and i beheld and when he had opened the sixth seal and lo there fell there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became his blood and the stars of heaven fell into the earth even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places and the kings, here it is, of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every freeman, hid themselves in the dens, and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of His wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? They've fallen. They've buried themselves. They've literally given up. They, they want now for the mountains that were their protection to fall onto them and be their demise, begging that they would not have to face Almighty God as, as He comes and is clearly initiating His wrath upon the face of the earth. Perhaps they've heard now that gospel as the angel comes crying it out through all nations and kindreds and tongues and fear falls over them. They do what they're supposed to do, but it's too late. And now they're begging to die. They're wishing that the rocks would fall on them so they would not have to face the lamb at such a time as this. And so now you can see why the statement will be made, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, is fallen. And yet when you look forward, there's more mentions of Babylon. She's given up at this point. She's doomed. Her demise is set. She's ready for destruction to fall upon her. And why would it be so? Well, Babylon, last day's Babylon, was a leader, was a pied piper of sorts from, for the whole earth and to the whole earth, bringing fornication to them, as it says. All nations drank of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And so this 
city, this great city brought fornication to all people, brought this wicked lifestyle to all peoples, spread herself for everybody, laid down before them even, and, and brought that wickedness about. And so, because she did so, now she is fallen. And that great gospel of recompense and redemption come together but judge this great whore. Now we can find out a little bit more about last day's Babylon by gleaning from the book of Isaiah. Keep your finger and go to Isaiah chapter 13. In Isaiah chapter 13, it's referring to, I believe, in Isaiah's day, the judgment that's coming upon Babylon. But so much and so often we see where, where that will signify or typify the last days and, and show us what would also happen in last days Babylon. Isaiah 13, beginning in verse 1, says, The burden of Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos did see. Now he saw this, and it would have likened him, it would have come to his mind in the immediate context. He would maybe have, have thought about last days or things that would come to pass. But he sees this, and he says, Lift up a banner upon the high mountain. Exalt the voice unto them. Shake the hand that they may go into the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for mine anger, even them that rejoice in my highness. The noise of a multitude in the mountains, like of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts mustereth the hosts of the battle. They come from a far country, even from the end of heaven, even the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. How ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt. And they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and, and he shall destroy the sinners out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity, and I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore, I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts, and in the day of his fierce anger. And you can see how that can be brought into the context of Revelation pretty clearly. I mean, the sun and moon there is being darkened. The stars of heaven are not giving their light. It says the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. Multiple times indicating that, yes, that is a judgment happening on Babylon then. But we also have a last day's Babylon who's going to fall under the same type of judgment. Making a man more precious than Ophir. Or a golden wedge of the same. His wrath is coming. The day of his fierce anger is coming. He's shaking the heavens. All of the iniquity, all of the sinners shall be destroyed out of it in that great and terrible day of the Lord. And it's contrasting here and what we'll find, go back to Revelation chapter 14, the recompense of the wicked with the consolation of the righteous. You can find Babylon falling, fallen, in verse 8, and it continues on in verse 9, it says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice. And here is the, the basically finality of what happened in the previous chapter. We see a mark, and the consequence is that unless you have it, you can't buy or sell. We don't exactly see what the consequence is of taking it. Some people might read that and say, oh, well, I can take part in commerce. I can take part in society if I take this mark, and so maybe it's not a bad thing. But verse 9 in chapter 14 clearly indicates it's a very bad and evil and wicked thing. It happened to any man. In verse 9 it says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. 
We know that the Bible says that Christians are preserved and saved and, and spared from the wrath of God. And yet these that take their mark, the opposite is so. They absolutely shall drink of indignation and wrath of God poured out without mixture. Continues and says, And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Indicating that when that third angel shouts out, he's giving judgment to what has already taken place. I wonder if people knew when they took it, or if people that don't read the Bible are going to be completely shocked to find out they're unredeemable. Will they care? I don't know. Will they weep and mourn over that fact? We don't know. Certainly the flames of hell will bring them to a state of mourning and finally giving praise to God. But we don't know if there will be any semblance of a conscience left in men at this point. I am thinking no. Because we find later on God returns. And at that time that he does, men are still spitting and mocking and fighting against God, recognizing him as so. This man that takes the mark shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Verse 11, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for a little time? No, forever and ever. And they have no rest for a moment? No! They have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. And so, recompense, judgment fell upon all that took the mark at this time. And then contrast of consolation is made. For the saints. Verse 12 it says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. You know what I believe that's doing? It's saying, look, the marks upon them, death is upon them, destruction is upon them. Here are they which are redeemed. The righteous will shine forth as the light in those last days. It'll be clear who is not marked. They're doing all sorts of scanners and stuff as you enter into places, and we all talk about the technology of detecting the mark. I think the mark of the beast will be such that everyone that has to take it, it'll be clear that they have it, and those that don't have it and are saved, it'll be clear that they're not. The Bible records them as shining forth as the light. There's a brightness to them, whereas there's dimness and darkness to those that take the mark. Already condemned to their final destination of fire and brimstone, where they will suffer in the presence of God. But here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. We can see them clearly. Blessed are they. Patient are they. They're consoled. They're, they're, they're saved from this destruction that is to come. Verse 13, it says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Blessed are those that die in the Lord from this time on. I, indeed, I believe we're blessed even now when we die in the Lord. But here there's a special command, a special pronouncement that's made and in, in, in to these perhaps more encouragement to get them to press on. He, he that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved at this time. And they're striving and they're working. And it says here though, it says now, at this point, now at this location in history, it says they may rest from their labors. Finally, they may rest from their labors when they pass away, but their works do follow them. I believe these are working right up into the end, keeping the commandments, showing forth their good work, keeping on uh, preaching the gospel best they can, showing forth their works, following Christ by faith, another good work that is following after them as they pass on into eternity with Christ. We need to pray, as I talked about at the beginning, that we, we be accounted worthy to escape these things which shall come. We need to pray that we're worthy and strong enough to stand up in the evil day. We need to be constantly meditating upon his word, because if we stand here, there's a special blessing indicated. There's a special promise made that, that here is the patience. Here are they that keep the commandments. They're seen. We know them. God knows them. Their works follow them, and they can finally rest. What a blessing to receive of that time. Now in verse 14 it says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Now who's that riding on the white cloud? Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so, amen. I am 
Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty, Jesus, 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 coming in that white cloud. All over the context of Revelation chapter 1, signified as the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. And the Lamb that follows the saints through the passages of Revelation chapter 13. Here, the Lamb, the Son of Man, has the golden crown upon his head and a sharp sickle in his hand as he arrives on a white cloud. Now, the angel reports what just took place. He says in verse 15, this angel comes to Jesus there, sitting on his cloud, verse 15, and another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice, to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, and the harvest of the earth is ripe. It's interesting because Jesus said, Back in the Gospels, no man knoweth the day and the hour but my Father only. And we see also an indication of that here where the angel had to go and detect whether the earth was right. Detect whether the time was come and bring it to the Lord sitting upon his cloud where he could finally be told it's ready. The earth is ripe. The time has come for thee to harvest. Now, if we remember back in chapter 7, we, we showed that that was, we believe, the rapture, right? Chapter 7, <clears throat> beginning in verse 9, chapter 7 and verse 9, there's a great multitude, which no man can number of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hand, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Down in verse 14 it says, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great temptation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell with them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall sun light on them any more. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and he shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And so these are they which came out of great tribulation, which happened in the previous chapters. And we've already talked about this. Now... They're not numerable, these. It's saying they're of all kindreds and all tongues and all nations have come out of great tribulation. We can refer also to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 21. I won't go there for the sake of time. It says immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give his light. Right before that in verse 21, it says, Then shall be great tribulation, which the world hath never seen to this time, nor shall ever be. The great tribulation shown in Matthew chapter 24 precedes the rapture of the church. They're brought out of tribulation. They cry salvation. And here in Matthew chapter 14, a little bit more detail is given to what this whole context means. So here is a reaping. The angel says the earth is ripe. And in verse 16 it says, And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. A little more detail, but not a lot. It just simply says that Jesus, the Son of Man that was sitting on the cloud, he thrust in his sickle, and the earth was reaped. Just like that. It was over with. The earth was reaped in that moment. Now, what is this harvest? What is this reaping that's being described? The earth is reaped, and I believe there's two types that are reaped at this moment. We find, just as he's contrasting the wicked that have taken the mark and the righteous, which are waiting for the redemption of Christ, there's the patient saints, and then there's the perverted sinners. More so than just your average sinner, not they have a mark in their right hand and in their forehead. They're perverted so much so that they don't even have a hope in reaching heaven. They're doomed. Their final destination is set. They are now ordained in order to fire and brimstone which will come upon them. And now the earth is ready for harvest. Who's being harvested now? Well, do you remember a certain parable, Matthew chapter 13? A certain parable where there are two types being harvested. Matthew chapter 13. The parable I'm referring to, of course, is the parable of the wheat and the tares. 
In Matthew chapter 13, the first thing we can do is we can look in verse 40. I'll read it as we get there. Matthew 13 and verse 40, it says, As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall be, so shall it be in the end of this world. So it's clear that Jesus is talking about the end of this world. Now go back to verse 24, and we'll read through the parable. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, an enemy hath done this. The servant said unto them, Wilt, then, wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? And so they say, Well, if there's tares among the wheat, should we not go and try to detect them and root them up? But right now where we stand today, it's not easy to tell who's a tear, who's a reprobate, who's lost. I mean, unless they're out there waving a rainbow flag, it's, it's hard to detect. Even so much the more if they're doing that. People behave in all sorts of weird and twisted ways. And they aren't necessarily doomed. So here at this time in the world, we have an undetected, basically, characteristic. Some are wheat, some are tares. Some have decided one way or another. But more or less, more often, they're just kind of sitting in the middle making their decision. And so, when the servant comes and he says, well, well should we bring them up together? He says they're indistinguishable. The wheat and the tares are the same. They look the same. So, verse 30 says, Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat until my barn. So it seemed that once they've grown together, and the time of harvest has come, now you can distinguish wheat from tares, and you can separate the tares to burn, and the bundles of wheat can be brought in. So, if you continue on into verse 36, as Jesus often does, and I'm thankful for it, then sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him and said, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. <clears throat> so they didn't get it. So they come to Christ in private and ask him. Verse 37, He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. The reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And I don't think that necessarily is a sequence of events. When he says that they're going to gather together in verse 41, the offending and the iniquity and those that, that are wicked those that are of the devil, to cast them into a furnace of fire. Then shall the righteous appear. I think that's just indicating that's the time when the righteous will appear. When? At the time of the harvest. When's that? The last days. It'll be clear that the righteous shine forth as the sun. They will be in the kingdom of the Father, but it'll be easy then for the angels to decipher which is which and make the proper judgment. Back in Revelation chapter 14, we find that parable actually taking place. Now in real time, now in the book of Revelation, giving us the finality of all things. We know the Bible promises that the righteous will be clothed in white before the throne of God when they are redeemed unto him. In verse 14, or chapter 14 and verse 16, it says, And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle, and the earth was reaped. There's the event. And in verse 17, And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came from the altar, which had power over fire. Now, didn't the parable show that God was sending forth his angels to reap in these last days? And here's at least two. 
one that's coming with a sharp sickle, one that has power over fire, and cried with a loud cry unto him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. So not only did this angel have power over fire, brought in the with the sickle, brought had the angel bring in with the sickle those that offended. They're brought into the presence of the Lamb, you know, without the city. And then immediately, as it says in verse 10, they're tormented in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb. They can't stand for the righteousness that is before them, and so they burn up. And we've seen that so many times in scriptures. I dealt with that in the presence of the Lord sermon. Here, they're brought, and they're to be burned in the presence of God. Not only that, but they're brought and placed into a wine press. And when that thing is squeezed, out comes the blood even unto the horse bridles. And so is fulfilled, and it's hard for us to think about these these days. But a little bit more and more, it, it seems to come to pass. Psalm 58 verse 10 says, The righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. And that's like, ew, gross, icky. But you know we're getting more and more. The Bible teaches that, that men are deceived and being deceived. The world is waxing worse and worse. And the abominations that men would do are just, are just running rampant, getting worse and worse and worse and worse. To the point where you can see at a time when there's a mark instituted, and if you don't have it, you die. When there's a great persecution on believers, when believers are up in heaven crying out, How long, Lord, faithful and true, dost thou not judge them upon the earth? You can see the torment and the woe people have seeing their loved ones fall. People seeing the, the great deception dragging down those that would be saved and, and condemning them to a devil's hell. You can see now why when that final day comes, when Christ shows up at his harvest, the tares and wheat are evident. He brings in the wheat there in verse 16. The earth was reaped. Christ gets his own unto him. And then also the tares are gathered. They're burned. They're brought to be cast into a wine press where that blood would pour out into the horse bridle. When so much misery is rampant as, and it's on the hands of those wicked evildoers, you can see why Christians would rejoice in those last days, even though it's something that we think of now as being rather gruesome and rather uh, disturbing to, to witness. But this is all part of God's plan, and this is all in his due order, and this is all according to his righteous judgment. So I believe that once this happens, we'll understand. It'll make sense. It'll be realized, and we'll say, oh, okay. Now I can see why God was so angry with the wicked. I mean, it's a shame to even speak of those things which are done in them in secret. But, you know, we're going to see some things, not done in secret anymore, but manifested before us. And it's going to be gruesome. It's going to be disgusting. It's going to be disturbing if we live unto these last days, if we're spared from all of the destruction. And then we can see Jesus coming and we can patiently wait for him, following after his commandments all along the way. When finally that judgment, the end of the world, that great harvest comes, it'll make perfect sense to us when God divides the wheat from the tares when God shows us who is right, and when God finally, finally sets things back in order. We're going to continue to learn more about this, but I believe this is another chapter that just kind of zoomed out on what's coming, and then it shows us the big picture, and now we're going to see in the subsequent chapters more detail about the events that just took place. Amen. Thank you, Father.